Hello everyone, Pastor Dan again with the Athens Public Library, and uh, we're going to read some more of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We are just about to start reading chapter 16, and uh, if you remember, we left off with uh, Aslan having risen from the dead and uh, gone off to the witch's castle uh, and uh, leapt the walls, and now we just don't know what's going to happen next. So, chapter 16, What Happened About the Statues What an extraordinary place, cried Lucy. All those stone animals and people, too, it's like a museum. Hush, said Susan, Aslan's doing something. He was, indeed. He had bounded up to the stone lion and breathed on him. Then, without waiting a moment, he whisked round, almost as if he had been a cat chasing its tail, and breathed also on the stone dwarf, which, as you remember, was standing a few feet from the lion with its back to it. Then he pounced on a tall stone dryad which stood beyond the dwarf, turned rapidly aside to deal with a stone rabbit on his right, and rushed on to two centaurs. But at that moment, Lucy said, Oh, Susan, look, look at the lion. I expect you've seen someone put a lighted match to a bit of newspaper, which is propped up in a grate against an unlit fire. And for a second, nothing seems to have happened. And then you notice a tiny streak of flame creeping along the edge of the newspaper. It was like that now. For a second after Aslan had breathed upon him, the stone lion looked just the same. Then a tiny streak of gold began to run along his white marble back. Then it spread. Then the color seemed to lick all over him as the flame licks all over a piece of paper. Then, while his hind quarters were still obviously stone, the lion shook his mane and all the heavy stone folds rippled into living air. And he opened a great red mouth, warm and living, and gave a prodigious yawn. And now his hind legs had come to life. He lifted one of them and scratched himself. Then, having caught sight of Aslan, he went bounding after him and frisked around him, whimpering with delight and jumping up to lick his face. Of course, the children's eyes turned to follow the lion, but the sight they saw was so wonderful they soon forgot about him. Everywhere the statues were coming to life. The courtyard looked no longer like a museum. It looked more like a zoo. Creatures were running after Aslan and dancing round him till he was almost hidden in the crowd. Instead of all that deadly white, the courtyard was now a blaze of colors. Glossy chestnut sides of centaurs, indigo horns of unicorns, dazzling plumage of of birds, reddy brown of foxes, dogs, and satyrs, yellow stockings and crimson hoods of dwarfs, and the birch girls in their silver, and the beach girls in fresh transparent green, and the larch girls in green so bright that it was almost yellow. And instead of the deadly silence, the whole place rang with the sound of happy roarings, brayings, yelpings, barkings, squealings, cooings, neighings, stamping, shouts, hurrahs, songs, and laughter. Oh, said Susan in a different tone. Look, I mean, I wonder, is it safe? Lucy looked and saw that Aslan had just breathed on the feet of the stone giant. It's all right, shouted Aslan joyously. Once the feet are put right, all the rest of him will follow. That wasn't exactly what I meant, whispered Susan to Lucy. But it was too late to do anything about it now, even if Aslan would have listened to her. The change was already creeping up the giant's legs. Now he was moving his feet. A moment later, he lifted his club off his shoulder, rubbed his eyes, and said, Bless me, I must have been asleep. Now, where's that dratted little witch that was running about on the ground? Somewhere just by my feet it was. 
But when everyone shouted up to him to explain what had really happened, and when the giant had put his hand to his ear and got them to repeat it all again, so that at last he understood, then he bowed down till his head was no further off than the top of a haystack, and touched his cap repeatedly to Aslan, beaming all over his honest, ugly face. Giants of any sort are so rare in England now, and so few giants are good-tempered that ten to one you have never seen a giant when his face is beaming. It's a sight well worth looking at. Now for the inside of this house, said Aslan. Look alive, everyone, upstairs and downstairs and in my lady's chamber. Leave no corner unsearched. You never know where some poor prisoner may be concealed. And into the interior they all rushed, and for several minutes the whole of that dark, horrible, fusty old castle echoed with the opening of windows and with everyone's voices crying out at once, Don't forget the dungeons! Give us a hand with this door! Here's another little winding stair! Oh, I say! Here's a poor kangaroo! Call Aslan! Whew! How it smells in here! Look out for trap doors! Up here! There are a whole lot more on the landing! But the best of all was when Lucy came rushing upstairs, shouting out, Aslan! Aslan! I found Mr. Tumnus! Oh, do come quick! A moment later, Lucy and the little fawn were holding each other by both hands and dancing round and round for joy. The little chap was none the worse for having been a statue and was, of course, very interested in all she had to tell him. But at last the ransacking of the witch's fortress was ended. The whole castle stood empty with every door and window open and the light and sweet spring air flooding into all the dark and evil places which needed them so badly. The whole crowd of liberated statues surged back into the courtyard, and it was then that someone, Tumnus, I think, first said, But how are we going to get out? For Aslan had got in by a jump and the gates were still locked. That'll be all right, said Aslan, and then, rising on his hind legs, he bawled up at the giant. Hi, you up there, he roared. What's your name? Giant Rumble Buffin, if it please your honor, said the giant once more, touching his cap. Well then, Giant Rumble Buffin, said Aslan, just let us out of this, will you? Certainly, your honor, it will be a pleasure, said Giant Rumble Buffin. Stand well away from the gates, you all you little ones. Then he strode to the gate himself, and bang, 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 went his huge club. The gates creaked at the first blow, cracked at the second, and shivered at the third. Then he tackled the towers on each side of them, and after a few minutes of crashing and thudding, both the towers and a good bit of the wall on each side went thundering down in a mass of hopeless rubble, and when the dust cleared, it was odd, standing in that dry, grim, stony yard, to see through the gap all the grass and waving trees and sparkling streams of the forest, and the blue hills beyond that, and beyond them the sky. Blowed if I ain't all in a muck sweat, said the giant, puffing like the largest railway engine. Comes like of being out of condition. I suppose neither of you young ladies has such a thing as a pocker, pocket handkerchief about you. Yes, I have, said Lucy, standing on tiptoe and holding her handkerchief up as far as you, she could reach. Thank you, Missy, said the giant rumble buffin, stooping down. Next moment, Lucy got rather a fright, for she found herself caught up in mid-air between the giant's finger and thumb. But just as she was getting near his face, he suddenly realized, he suddenly started, and then put her gently back on the ground, muttering, Bless me, I picked up the little girl instead. I beg your pardon, Missy. I thought you was the handkerchief. No, no, said Lucy, laughing. Here it is. This time he managed to get it, but it was only about the si same size to him that a saccharine tablet would be to you, so that when she saw him solemnly rubbing it to and fro across his great red face, she said, I'm afraid it's not much use to you, Mr. Rumblebuffin. Not at all, not at all, said the giant politely. Never met a nicer handkerchief. So fine, so handy, so I don't know how to describe it. 
What a nice giant he is, said Lucy to Mr. Tumnus. Oh, yes, replied the fawn. All the buffins always were one of the most respected of all the giant families in Narnia. Not very clever, perhaps. I never knew a giant that was, but an old family with traditions, you know. If he'd been the other sort, he'd never have turned him in, she'd never have turned him into stone. At this point, Aslan clapped his paws together and called for silence. Our day's work is not yet over, he said, and if the witch is to be finally de be defeated before bedtime, we must find the battle at once. And join in, I hope, sir, added the largest of the centaurs. Of course, said Aslan. And now, those who can't keep up, that is, children, dwarfs, and small animals, must ride on the backs of those who can, that is, lions, centaurs, unicorns, horses, giants, and eagles. Those who are good with their noses must come in front with us lions to smell out where the battle is. Look lively and sort yourselves. And with a great deal of bustle and cheering they did. The most pleased of the lot was the other lion, who kept running about everywhere, pretending to be very busy, but really in order to say to everyone he met, did you hear what he said? Us lions. That means him and me. Us lions. That's what I like about Aslan. No sides, no standoffishness. Us lions. That meant him and me. At least he went on saying this till Aslan had loaded himself up with three dwarfs, one dryad, two rabbits, and a hedgehog. That steadied him a bit. When all were ready, it was a big sheepdog who actually helped Aslan most in getting them sorted into their proper order. They set out through the gap in the castle wall. At first, the lions and dogs went nosing about in all directions, but then suddenly one great hound picked up the scent and gave a bay. There was no time lost after that. Soon all the dogs and lions and wolves and other hunting animals were going at full speed with their noses to the ground, and all the others streaked out for about half a mile behind them, were following as fast as they could. The noise was like an English fox hunt, only better because every now and then with the music of the hounds was mixed the roar of the other lion and sometimes the far deeper and more awful roar of Aslan himself. Faster and faster they went, as the scent became easier and easier to follow, and then, just as they came to the last curve in, the, in a narrow winding valley, Lucy heard above all these noises another noise, a different one, which gave her a queer feeling in inside. It was a noise of shouts and shrieks and of the clashing of metal against metal. Then they came out of the narrow valley, and at once saw she saw the reason. There stood Peter and Edmund and all the rest of Aslan's army, fighting desperately against the crowd of horrible creatures whom she had seen last night. Only now, in the daylight, they looked even stranger and more evil and more deformed. There also seemed to be far more of them. Peter's army, which had their backs to her, looked terribly few and there were statues dotted all over the battle battlefield, so apparently the witch had been using her wand. But she did not seem to be using it now. She was fighting with her stone knife. It was Peter she was fighting, both of them going at it so hard that Lucy could hardly make out what was happening. She only saw the stone knife and Peter's sword flashing so quickly that they looked like three knives and three swords. That pair were in the center. On each side, the line stretched out. Horrible things were happening wherever she looked. Off my back, children, shouted Aslan, and they both tumbled off. Then, with a roar that shook all Narnia from the western lamppost to the shores of the eastern sea, the great beast flung himself upon the white witch. Lucy saw her face and lifted towards him for one second with an expression of terror and amazement. Then lion and witch had rolled over together, but with the witch underneath, and at the same moment all warlike creatures whom Aslan had led from the witch's house rushed madly on the enemy lines, dwarfs with their battle axes, dogs with teeth, the giant with his club, and his feet also crushed dozens of the foe. 
unicorns with their horns, centaurs with swords and hoofs, and Peter's tired army cheered, and the newcomers roared, and the enemy squealed and gibbered till the woods re-echoed with the din of that onset. And now for the final chapter of The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe. But don't worry, there's more. We've got more books coming. Chapter 17, The Hunting of the White Stag. The battle was all over a few minutes after their arrival. Most of the enemy had been killed in the first charge of Aslan and his companions, and when those who were still living saw that the witch was dead, they either gave themselves up or took flight. The next thing that Lucy knew was that Peter and Aslan were shaking hands. It was strange to, to her to see Peter looking as he looked now. His face was so pale and stern, and he seemed so much older. It was all Edmund's doing, Aslan, Peter was saying. We'd have been beaten if it hadn't been for him. The witch was turning our troops into stone right and left, but nothing would stop him. He fought his way through three ogres to where she was just turning one of your leopards into a statue, and when he reached her, he, in, he had the sense to bring his sword smashing down on her wand instead of trying to go for her directly and simply, simply getting made a statue himself for his pains. That was the mistake all the rest were making. Once her wand was broken, we began to have some chance, if we hadn't lost so many already. He was terribly wounded. We must go and see him. They found Edmund in charge of Mrs. Beaver, a little way back from the fighting line. He was covered with blood. His mouth was open, and his face was a nasty green color. Quick, Lucy, said Aslan. Then, almost for the first time, Lucy remembered the precious cordial that had been given to her for a Christmas present. Her hands trembled so much that she could hardly undo the stopper, but she managed it in the end and poured a few drops into her brother's mouth. There are other people wounded, said Aslan, while she was still looking eagerly into Edmund's face and wondering if the cordial would have any result. Yes, I know, said Lucy crossly. Wait a minute. Daughter of Eve, said Aslan in a graver voice, others also are at the point of death. Must more people die for Edmund? I'm sorry, Aslan, said Lucy, getting up and going with him. And for the next half hour they were busy, she attending to the wounded while he restored those who had been turned into stone. When at last she was free to come back to Edmund, she found him standing on his feet and not only healed of his wounds, but looking better than she had he seen him look oh, for ages. In fact, ever since her fir his first term at that horrid school, which was where he had begun to go wrong, he had become his real old self again, and he, and he could look you in the face. And there on the field of battle, Aslan made him a knight. Does he know, whispered Lucy to Susan, what Aslan did for him? Does he know what the arrangement with the witch really was? Hush, no, of course not, said Susan. Oughtn't he to be told, said Lucy. Oh, surely not, said Susan. It would be too awful for him. Think how you'd feel if you, if you were he. All the same, I think he ought to know, said Lucy. But at that moment they were interrupted. That night they slept where they were. How Aslan provided food for them all, I don't know. But somehow or other they found themselves all sitting down on the grass to a fine high tea about eight o'clock. The next day they began marching eastward down the side of the great river. And the next day after that, at about tea time, they actually reached the mouth. The castle of Caraparavel on its little hill towered up above them, before them were the sands with rocks and little pools of salt water and seaweed, and the smell of the sea and long miles of bluish-green waves breaking forever and ever on the beach. And oh, the cry of the seagulls. Have you heard it? Can you remember? That evening after the tea, after tea, the four children all managed to get down to the beach again and their great and get their shoes and stockings off and feel the sand between their toes. 
but the next day was more solemn. For then, in the great hall of Ker Paravel, that wonderful hall with the ivory roof and the west wall hung with peacock's feathers, and the eastern door which looks towards the sea, in the presence of all their friends and to the sound of trumpets, Aslan solemnly crowned them and led them to the four thrones amid deafening shouts of, Long live King Peter! Long live Queen Susan! Long live King Edmund! Long live Queen Lucy! Once a king or queen in Narnia, always a king or queen. Bear it well, sons of Adam. Bear it well, daughters of Eve, said Aslan. And through the eastern door, which was wide open, came the voices of the mermen and mermaids swimming close to the shore and singing in honor of their new kings and queens. So the children sat on their thrones, and scepters were put into their hands, and they gave rewards and honors to all their friends, to Tumnus the fawn, and to the beavers, and giant Rumblebuffin, to the leopards, and the good centaurs, and the good dwarfs, and to the lion. And that night there was a great feast in Caraparavel, and revelry, and dancing, and gold flashed, and wine flowed, and answering to the music inside, but stranger, sweeter, and more piercing, came the music of the sea people. But amidst all these rejoicings, Aslan himself quietly slipped away, and when the kings and queens noticed that he wasn't there, they said nothing about it, for Mr. Beaver had warned them, He'll be coming and going, he has, he has said. One day you'll see him and another you won't. He doesn't like being tied down. And of course he has other countries to attend to. It's quite all right. He'll often drop in. Only mu you mustn't press him. press him. He's wild, you know. Not like a tame lion. And now, as you see, this story is nearly, but not quite, at an end. These two kings and queens governed Narnia well, and long and happy was their reign. At first, much of their time was spent in seeking out the remains of the White Witch's army and destroying them, and indeed for a long time there would be news of evil things lurking in the wilder parts of the forest, a haunting here and a killing there, a glimpse of a werewolf one month and a rumor of a hag the next. But in the end, all that foul brood was stamped out, and they made good laws, and kept the peace, and saved good trees from being unnecessarily cut down, and liberated young dwarfs and young satyrs from being sent to school, and liberated, um, and generally stopped busybodies and interferers, and encouraged ordinary people who wanted to live and let live. And they drove back the fierce giants, quite a different sort from Giant Rumblebuffin, in the north of Narnia, when these ventured across the frontier, and they entered into friendship and alliance with the countries beyond the sea, and paid them visits of state, and received visits of state from them. And they themselves grew and changed as the years passed over them. And Peter became a tall and deep-chested man, and a great warrior. <clears throat> and he was called King Peter the Magnificent. And Susan grew into a tall and gracious woman with black hair that fell almost to her feet, and the kings of the countries beyond the sea began to send ambassadors asking for her hand in marriage, and she was called Queen Susan the Gentle. Edmund was a graver and quieter man than Peter, and great in counsel and judgment. He was called King Edmund the Just. But as for Lucy... She was always gay and golden-haired, and all princes in those parts desired her to be their queen, and her own people called her Queen Lucy the Valiant. So they lived in great joy, and if ever they remembered their life in this world, it was only as one remembers a dream. And one year it fell out that Tumnus, who was a middle-aged fawn by now and beginning to be stout, came down river and brought them news that the white stag had once more appeared in his parts. The white stag, who would give you wishes if you caught him. So these two kings and queens, with the principal members of their court, rode a-hunting with horns and hounds in the western woods to follow the white stag. And they had not hunted long before they had a sight of him. 
and he led them a great pace over rough and smooth and through thick and thin till the horses of all, all the courtiers were tired out and these four were still following and they saw the stag enter into a thicket where their horses could not follow then said king peter for they talked in quite a different style now having been kings and queens for so long fair consorts let us now alight from our horses and follow this beast into the thicket for in all my days i never hunted a nobler qu quarry sir said the others even so let us do so they alighted and tied their horses to trees and went on into the thick wood on foot and as soon as they had entered it queen susan said fair friends here is a great marvel for i seem to see a tree of iron in it madam said king edmund if you look well upon it you shall see it is a pillar of iron with a lantern set on the top thereof by the lion's mane a strange device said king peter to set a lantern here where the trees cluster so thick about it and high and so high above it that if it were lit it should give light to no man sir said queen lucy by likelihood when this post and this lamp were set here there were smaller trees in the place or fewer or none for this is a young wood and the iron post is old and they stood looking upon it then said king edmund i know not how it is but this lamp on the post where it worketh upon me strangely it runs in my mind that i have seen the like before as it were in a dream or in the dream of a dream sir answered they all it is even so with us also and more said queen lucy for it will not go out of my mind that if we pass this post and lantern either we shall find strange adventures or else some great change of our fortunes madam said king edmund the like foreboding stirreth in my heart also and in mine fair brother said king peter and in mine too said queen susan wherefore by my counsel we shall lightly return to our horses and follow this white stag no further madam said king peter i therein i pray thee to have me excused for never since we four were kings and queens in narnia have we set our hands to any high matter as battles quests feats of arms acts of justice and the like and then given over but always we have taken in hand of the same we have achieved sister said queen lucy my royal brother speaks rightly and it seems to me we should be shamed if for any fearing or foreboding we turned back from following so noble a beast as now we have in chase and so say i said king edmund and i have such desire to find the signification of this thing that i would not by my good will turn back for the richest jewel in all narnia and all the islands then in the name of Aslan, said Queen Susan, if ye will all have it so, let us go on and take the adventure that shall fall to us. So, these kings and queens entered the thicket, and before they had gone a score of paces, they all remembered the thing that they had seen was called a lamp post. And before they had gone twenty more, they noticed that they were making their way not through branches, but through coats and the next moment they all came tumbling out of a wardrobe door into the empty room and they were no longer kings and queens in their hunting array but just peter susan edmund and lucy in their old clothes it was the same day and the same hour of the day on which they had all gone into the wardrobe to hide mrs macready and the visitors were still talking in the passage but luckily they never came into the empty room and so the children weren't caught and that would have been the very end of the story if it hadn't been that they felt they really must explain to the professor why four of the coats out of his wardrobe were missing and the professor who was a very remarkable man didn't tell them not to be silly or not to tell lies but believed the whole story no he said I don't think it will be any good trying to go back through the wardrobe to get door to get the coats. You won't get into Narnia again by that route. Nor would the coats be much use by now if you did. Eh? What's that? 
Yes, of course, you'll get back to Narnia again someday. Once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. But don't go trying to use the same route twice. Indeed, don't try to get there at all. It'll happen when you're not looking for it. And don't talk too much about it, even among yourselves. And don't mention it to anyone else, unless you find that they've had adventures of the same sort themselves. Was that? How will you know? Well, you'll know, all right. Odd things, they say. Even their looks. We'll let the secret out. Keep your eyes open. Bless me, what do they teach them at these schools? And that is the very end of the adventure of the wardrobe. But if the professor was right, it was only the beginning of the adventures of Narnia. Thanks for reading along with me. I hope you enjoyed it. And we will be back uh, next week for the next book, book number three, The Horse and His Boy. So hopefully we'll see you then. Take care.